Hello beautiful people. In this guide I will review every single US prop bomber in War Thunder. Hope you enjoy. As mentioned in the short intro, this video will cover all the prop bombers, not the jet bombers. Those will be covered in a separate video. All the bombers will be covered in the following manner. First there will be a couple of remarks. Then there will be a pro and con section, followed by a review of the bomb load and the defensive armament, ending with a little bit of pew pew and some final remarks. You can in general describe the American bombers like this. They overall have decent speed, good defensive armament, some even have excellent offensive armament. They all have self sealing fuel tanks, in general good armor protection, decent bomb load, and are cheap to repair. The TPD is a strong first entry for the US bomber tree. It has good versatility, but the cons for the price of being slow. But let's just dive right into it. Some of the pros, good flag characteristics. The TPD is small and nimble, and it's actually difficult for SBAs and fighters to pick it out, especially considering that this is actually a bomber. The TBD also handles very well at lower speeds and is easy to land. Considering the size, you're also getting a decent bomb load and you have access to both torpedoes and regular bombs. Surprisingly, this little guy actually also comes with armor protection, but none for the gunner. From the front, the pilot is protected with a plate just behind the engine and from the back, there's a plate protecting his neck. And as I mentioned several times making the Japanese bomber guide, Enter flight school kids, do not enter aerial gunnery school. Another thing that's very nice about this bomber, but often overlooked, is the heavy machine gun you get access to offensively already. But more on that later. Some of the cons for the TBD. Although the TBD is a bomber, it still has a very low rate of climb. It's only 6.1 meters a second, once fully spaded. And for such a small aircraft, that is pretty low. The TBD has no bomb bay and that increases the drag on the plane itself when you have the bombs attached or the torpedo. Although the TBD can both carry bombs and a torpedo, it has limited bomb drop options, but I'll come back to that later also. And lastly, as mentioned earlier, it is pretty slow. I could maximum get up to around 330 km an hour, even at level flight, at optimal altitude. That also means that everything will and can catch up to you. But not only has the TBD very low speed overall, the combat flaps rips off at around 212 km an hour, landing gear speed 185 km an hour, and very low ring rip speed with only 431 km an hour. So first off, a couple of bad things about the TBD's bomb load. The bombs are dropped in pairs, which means you have limited bomb drops overall. And since you do not have any bomb bay, you will have more drag on the aircraft whenever you have bombs attached. So you can either choose dropping 100 pound bombs in pairs, or have a single bomb drop with 500 pound bombs, and then 100 pound bombs. You can also drop two different torpedoes, but never drop the Mark 13. Always pick the Mark 1344. With the newer version of the torpedo, you can drop it from much higher altitude and at much higher speeds. The rear gunner uses a Browning light machine gun with plenty of ammunition and the Browning has a very impressive rate of fire with 1000 rounds a minute. The range of movement for the light machine gun is not the greatest but it's okay. The to Using the TBD to destroy bases with is not really worth it. Here I tried dropping the two 500 pound bombs on one base and then the remaining six 100 pound bombs on a second. So I won't suggest that you use the TBD to destroy bases with in ARB. Instead, use the bombs to destroy light tanks with and other ground targets. Good 
And once you have dropped all your bombs, you can use your 50 caliber heavy machine gun. And with 500 rounds of ammunition, you have plenty to both destroy other ground targets, light tanks, and even enemy aircraft with. I think the TBD is best used in ground RB though. And as annoying as it is not having a bomb bay and having to drop two bombs at a time, in ground RB it's actually an advantage. Most of the bombs you're dropping are 100 pounds and they have very little TNT, so there's a much better chance for a kill if you drop two at a time. Next on the list we have two hydroplanes, less torpedo bombers, the PBY Catalina and the PBY 5A Catalina and we're going to use the latter one. The only difference is that the 5A model has access to landing gear so you can actually land regularly on a landing strip. I've been high a couple of times making the Catalina because of all the glue I've been sniffing with my nose down in the model but hey, fun times. I mentioned it in the other guy when I made the video about the Japanese bombers. I really like the hydroplanes, they have so much personality in my opinion. Some of them might suck in their given role, but yeah, lots of personality. Some of the pros for the PBY Catalina, large TNT bomb load. So the Catalinas have the largest amount TNT we can drop of any bomber up to battery rating 2.3, and that's because of the sea mines you can drop. You can drop four of them, and they have over 500 kilograms of TNT in them each. And the cool thing is, you can also use it in ground RB. Up until it gets nerfed again, I guess. The Catalinas have pretty good defensive armament for the battle rating, and more on that later. Since the Catalinas are hydroplanes, you can also use them to cap points with in naval battles. Some of the cons for the Catalinas. Slow. I thought the TPD was slow, but the Catalinas are much slower. At optimal altitude, you can just about get up to 300 km an hour, and that's about it. Mediocre flight characteristics, so as you would suspect, just looking at Catalina, it flies basically like a brake. It's very slow at turning and has very poor climbing ability. The wings have a very low rip speed with only 400 km an hour, and strangely enough, after your wings have been ripped off, your landing gear is actually still attached if deployed. It has a rip off speed of 450 km an hour, which doesn't really make any sense, but hey. So it could be fun watching somebody land without any wings, but with the landing gear still attached. And lastly, don't be alarmed if you hit your landing flap keys just to find out that nothing happens, because the Catalinas don't have flaps at all. As mentioned before, the Catalinas bomb carrying capacity is very impressive, at least TNT wise. The weakest bomb load you can carry are 16 100 pound bombs, and those are dropped in pairs. All the other bomb loads are dropping the bombs one at a time, which is very nice. You can either carry 4 500 pound bombs, 4 1000 pound bombs, and the biggest bomb load, the 4 Mark 13 C mines. You can also carry 2 torpedoes, and once again, 
Don't worry about dropping the Mark 13s, only use the Mark 13 slash 44. So this semi-wet ventral turret position looks very uncomfortable. The gunner himself is not happy either, since he looks like shit. Both him and his gun looks like they belong in Minecraft. And if you guys are playing on consoles, I feel sorry for you. The gunner uses a fast firing browning light machine gun. He has very poor horizontal guidance with the weapon and only minus 45 degrees vertical guidance. You don't really have a lot of options when you're talking about belts for the browning light machine gun. So always go for the armor targets belt. You here have a mix of tracer bullets, armor piercing bullets and incendiary bullets. The waist or beam gunners both use a browning heavy machine gun and they have actually very good guidance in general. They do have a blind spot firing directly behind the aircraft and also the tail will get in the way. Besides that, they have excellent coverage both horizontally and vertically. Belt wise, always go for the universal belt for the 50 caliber browning since that build consists mainly of armor piercing incendiary bullets. The nose is being protected with another light machine gun with plenty of ammunition. Unfortunately you don't really have a lot of gun depression, but otherwise vertically and aiming upwards is just fine. Thanks to the SMIG pilot I can now demonstrate how nicely horizontal guidance the waste gunners have. With a high amount of TNT in the sea mines, you can actually drop them one at a time and kill a base with just one bomb. That means under ideal circumstances, you can destroy three bases and then put the last bomb on the airfield, just like I'm doing here. So as you can see here, the Catalina is pretty slow, it's actually very slow. So side climbing is not a bad idea. I would say once you get to around 5000 meters, most players will actually leave you alone, especially at this low BR. You can of course use the PBY in Grunner B with a heavy bomb load, but I don't think you should. I think it's kind of useless. Once you've dropped one or two bombs, I'm sure you're getting a kill because of the high TNT content in the mines, but you're sitting dark. Instead, use it for base bombing and airfield bombing in ARB. The B-18A sitting at battle rating 1.3 kind of looks like this early 1930s silvery whale which is pregnant and it kind of flies like that. Some of the pros for the B-18, you have a decent bomb load with some nice options and that's enough for around 1.5 base kills at your own BR. The flight characteristics is this kind of strange mix between good and bad. The wings have a very high rip speed with almost 600 km an hour. So you can get up to very high speeds in a dive without worrying about that. And oddly enough, your turning radius is just fine. 
And in combination with your very effective combat flaps, you can really turn the sucker around. Maximum speed is around 400 km an hour. And with that speed, a lot of biplanes will have trouble actually keeping up with you and sometimes you can even outrun them. It's easy to land and has a very low stall speed of around 100 km an hour. And some of the cons for the B-18. As I mentioned before, the wings have a high rip speed. Unfortunately, you need to be very careful using it. Even in a shallow dive of let's say 5 or 10 degrees, there's a high chance that you'll never recover. For some reason, the plane does not like to level out, even at lower speeds. And although the B-18 can turn quite well, it rolls very poorly. For a bomber of this size, the defensive armament is actually quite poor, but more on that later. Another con, you have no armor protection whatsoever. And lastly, I mentioned that the B-18 is easy to land, but the lowering of the landing gear is very, very slow. Looking at the Bombay, it's nice, but it's nothing overwhelming. You have access to 12 100 pound bombs, two 1,000 pound bombs, a single 2,000 pound bomb, eight 250 pound bombs, and four 500 pound bombs. It's enough to destroy 1.5 bases at your own BR, but that's about it. It's a pretty good bomb load, I just wish it would have been on a much better aircraft, because B-18 is kind of, well, mediocre in a lot of aspects when you're talking about a bomber. So you can either use the bomb load to destroy smaller ground targets with, or bases. It's really up to you. So compared to the ventral turret gunner of the PBY, this guy is much better looking. I guess he's not been exposed to all the seawater that the other guy has, and he has a much better skincare routine. This guy really knows how to moisturize. The movement of the Browning Lab machine gun is not impressive, but it's not bad either. Vertically, it's minus 45 degrees, and horizontally, it's plus minus 30 degrees. Looking at the position of the Dawson turret, I have come to the conclusion that it has been put there by a woman. I bet the Douglas Aircraft Company had a bring your spouse day, and the designer let his wife decide where to put the turret. But we all know that the main reason is that the wife said sex is off the table unless she gets some say in his job. The horizontal guidance of the turret is perfect since you can rotate it 360 degrees. And with a virtual guidance of 89 degrees, you can almost point the light machine gun straight up. But as you can guess, the gunner has a big blind spot just behind the aircraft, with a very large vertical stabilizer blocking his line of sight. The nose turret is placed rather oddly, and if the bombardier has explosive diarrhea or just farts a lot, it's going to be very uncomfortable. Oddly enough, when you look at how the machine gun is pointing, you only have minus 5 degrees vertical guidance, but you have plus 60. And horizontally, you have plus minus 70 degrees, which is just fine. So the overall protection is only 3 light machine guns, and that is rather poor for this type of aircraft. Although it's nice that the dorsal turret can rotate 360 degrees, only being equipped with one light machine gun means that it doesn't really do a whole lot of damage against, let's say, like here, another bomber. I'm using the four 500 pound bombs there and an E3 in order to destroy a base, and then I can drop the last one on the second. I think the best bomb load is probably the eight 250 pound bombs, and then just use those and start attacking some ground targets. I suppose you could use the single 2000 bomb drop for ground or B, but that's about it. At this low BR, the overall flight characteristics are just not good enough. Here I just wanted to show you how absolutely slowly the landing gear comes down. The B-18 has very low stall speed with around 100 km an hour. And I think it got to around 90 km an hour before I could feel that the plane actually started to lose lift.
Here at Battery Rating 2.0, we find another hydroplane, the PBM-1 Mariner. The Mariner is a somewhat new addition to War Thunder, and it got introduced in December 2020. And let's just get into it. Some of the pros for the Mariner. The PBM has actually very good defensive armament for this low battery rating. You have five turret positions, and they all have a 50 caliber browning. You have some very effective combat flaps, and with them you can actually outturn some other heavy fighters at this low BR. And speaking of the flaps in general, they are very strong and have very high rip speeds. There's both pros and cons when we're talking about where the fuel is located. The pros are, the only place you can find the fuel in the wings are in the wing roots. Some of the cons for the Mariner. It's pretty obvious, but the Mariner is a very large target, so you won't have any trouble of actually being seen and engaged. I just make that sound like a pro, but it's really, really not. In addition to uh, you being a very large target, you don't have any armor protection at all. And especially the rear gunner always seems to be the one being killed right away. The wings have a very low rip speed, but not even 400 km an hour. But again, strange enough, your combat flaps won't even rip off until close to 500 km an hour. So you can have your wing torn off, but your combat flaps will still be working. That's, thank you, that's just great. And lastly, the bad thing about the placement of the fuel is that most is actually in the fuselage. And if attacked from below, which you often will be, there's a pretty big chance that you'll just catch fire right away. The Mariner gets brownie points for having some cool looking Bombay doors. Um, yeah. Your options are 12 100 pound bombs, for 500 pound bombs and two 1000 pound bombs, four 1000 pound bombs, six 500 pound bombs, or six 250 pound bombs. So TNT wise compared to the Gasolina, this is very underwhelming. As I mentioned before, none of the gunners have any form of protection whatsoever and the rear gunner is actually very exposed. The gunner's vertical guidance is plus minus 40 degrees and horizontally it's only plus minus 30 degrees. So you will have difficulty actually tracking the baddies going left or right behind you. The waist or beam gunners have a vertical guidance of plus minus 45 degrees and horizontal guidance is minus 45 and plus 30. And that's actually okay since you have a dorsal turret that can pick up the slack. And speaking of the dorsal turret, he has a horizontal guidance of plus minus 180 degrees and a vertical guidance of plus 80 degrees. And with the combination of the rear gunner and the dorsal turret, you are actually well protected from attacks from behind. The nose gunner of the Mariner is definitely one of the better ones. He has a vertical guidance of minus 35 and plus 68 and a very large horizontal guidance of plus minus 84 degrees. So he has a large arc of fire where you can protect the plane from the front. So we have a very good defensive armament and sometimes at these low BRs it's kind of fun just to be on the offensive. And you can definitely use the Mariner also as a gunship. You can use the 50 calibers also to attack ground targets in ARV and harass other bombers. A playstyle would definitely be just to fly as fast as you can, well it's not going to be very fast. But get rid of your bombs and then just see what you can do with your 50 calibers. And of course, you can also use the Mariner in ground RB, although, eh, it's a little more dicey since you're such a large target. So I would suggest that you stay at altitude and use your 1000 pom poms to pick off some ground targets.
The B34 sitting at battery rating 2.7 is the first of the very fun and effective American medium bombers. And just like other American medium bombers, it favors offensive and defensive armament instead of a heavy bomb load. So let's dive right into the fun. Some of the pros for the B-34. You have good defensive armaments and more importantly, good offensive armament. Overall, you have very good flight characteristics for a medium bomber. You are quite fast with around 540 km an hour and your wings have a high rip speed with 630 km an hour so there's a chance that you can escape an attacker just by diving. Armor protection. Both gunners are protected with an armor plate each and the pilot is protected with two plates from behind and one from the front. Some of the cons for the B-34. Although the flight characteristics of all are good, the B-34 has some rather weak flaps. Regular speed with the combat flaps is just shy over 300 km an hour and the landing flaps will break off with just 230 km an hour. The landing gear also has a very low limit with only 230 km an hour. And that is in general in stark contrast with the other flight characteristics. You have a very poor bomb load. Good thing is you can also carry a torpedo, but other than that you only have two options for bomb loads. As you can see here, you don't really have that many offerings. Two different bomb loads consisting of either three 500 pound bombs and then four 250 pound bombs or seven 250 pound bombs. And then you have the option of one single torpedo. Good thing is, if you're easily confused, you don't really have to worry that much. This is the first time we actually seen two light machine guns and turrets and that's a good thing. And here we have two Brownings with 1,000 rounds of ammo each. The bad thing is that it has pretty bad horizontal and vertical guidance. The horizontal guidance is just plus minus 12 degrees and the vertical guidance is minus 25 and plus 8. And that is not very much. Luckily the dorsal gunner has unobstructed view towards the rear so he can help out the ventral gunner protecting the rear. He can rotate the turret 360 degrees and the turret has 85 degrees vertical guidance. And best of all, he has access to two heavy machine guns with 400 rounds of ammo each. And looking towards the nose, I'm not really sure what this guy is doing. I guess he's the bombardier because he's definitely not the gunner. I'm pretty sure that these machine guns are controlled by the pilot. But this is very nice though. Here we find two Browning light machine guns with a total of 750 rounds and two Browning heavy machine guns with 500 rounds total. Of course you can use the B-34 to destroy bases with, but I don't really think that's worth it. I think in ARB it's best to use this bomber for ground targets, so pillboxes, medium tanks, light tanks and so forth. And with the offensive armament you can actually use the bombs for pillboxes and medium tanks, and then just strafe the artillery pieces and triple A's with your forward facing machine guns. I don't know if you noticed but the camera position is kind of off behind the B-34. Compared to other bombers, the B-34's camera is more behind it instead of kind of above looking down on the aircraft. And it actually makes landing pretty difficult because you don't really get a sense of how close to the ground you are. And I hope they're gonna fix that at some point. So once unlocked, the B-34 fits in nicely with a ground RB 2.7 lineup. So you can bring in the M3 Lee and the Sherman with the 105.
The great thing about the B-34 here is that of course the forward face machine gun so you can strafe ground targets, maybe destroy some SPAGs and then just use your bomb loads on tanks. There's of course no reason to bring the 7 250 pound bombs, instead bring the biggest bomb load, the 4 250 pound bombs and then the 3 500 pound bombs. Or you can be really adventurous and try to see if you can kill anybody with a torpedo, well, good luck with that though. The B-34 is not super maneuverable once you get down and close to the ground, so that's something to look out for. And also with the camera position being a little off, it can sometimes become a little disorientating and you need to be careful of not just hitting the ground. So here we have the first of the really iconic US bombers, the B-25. In War Thunder we have access to four different versions of the B-25. In the bomber tree we find the first at 4.0, then one at 4.3, and then we also find two B-25s in the role of strike aircraft, both sitting at 4.0 and one is here called PBJ-1J and pbj 1H. There's a couple of differences between the PBJs and the regular B-25 and the bomber rolls. So you don't really have a bombardier in the PBJ and the node section is changed out so there's no glass at all. Instead we have many more machine guns and in the case of the H model even a 75mm cannon. So these aircraft were not used in a traditional bomber roll since they did not have a bombardier. Instead, they were used to destroy island bases with and to destroy and interrupt shipping. Some of the pros for the B-25. Consistent flight characteristics. I picked the word consistent because it does not give you any nasty surprises and that is definitely a pro. It's not very fast, it's not very slow either. I would not call the B-25 sluggish, but you can definitely feel its weight. And that is because of all the offensive armament, the defensive armament, and all the armor protection the B-25 has. At optimal altitude you can get to around 470 km an hour. It's not too slow, but it's not very fast either. The wings rip at around 600 km an hour, but in a dive you need to be careful. The combat flaps are good and you should definitely use those, and they have a rip up speed of around 400 km an hour. Tricycle landing gear. Firstly, you can hit the brakes right away and keep them activated and you don't have to worry about a nose over like it can happen with a tail dragger setup. That also means that it has a faster turnaround where you can faster get to a stop, rearm and repair, and thereby faster be airborne again. Excellent offensive and defensive armament. The B-25 is very well protected with a bunch of 50 caliber Browning spread all around the fuselage, but more on that later. 
Offensively, the B-25 really also packs a punch. And by the way, the only difference between the B-25 sitting at 4.0 and 4.3 is a single forward-facing heavy machine gun. So this model here has 7, while the 4.0 model only has only has 6. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that only was definitely in air quotes. Heavy armor protection. The B-25 actually has more armor protection than the B-17. And try listen to this. The front, side and rear of the cockpit is protected. The nose gun is protected. The pilot seats are protected. There's an armor plated bulkhead behind the dorsal turret. The waist gunners have some protection. And the tail gunner is both protected with a steel plate and bulletproof glass. With all that armor protection, you can really soak up a lot of light machine gun fire and even some of the pretty poor Japanese 20mm cannon rounds. And some of the cons for the B-25. Poor bomb load. And again, with all the weight of all the armament and armor protection, something has to suffer, and the bomber is definitely where it is. You do have a lot of different bomb loads to choose from, but none of them are really heavy. Saying that the flight characteristics are consistent does not of course mean that everything is pro. Close to the ground, the B-25 can become quite heavy, and don't try to turn fight anybody because you're definitely going to lose. By diving from your initial bomb altitude, you do need to pay attention. It's very easy, even in a shallow dive, to get past 500 km an hour, and then your plane starts locking up. The best speed for the B-25 is below 400 km an hour. Much faster than that, your rudders also tend to lock up. There's one more con, and in my opinion, it's actually the worst of the one I've listed. The engines overheat very quickly, so it doesn't take long whenever you whip or just fly at a regular 100% before the engines turn yellow and then turn red. And even in level flight, if you're just flying along at 100%, it takes 2 or 3 minutes and then they start to overheat and it's really annoying. So you constantly have to sit and monitor the engines and turn down the power if needed. You don't lack options when it comes to bomb load on the B-25. Unfortunately, they're still all pretty weak. You can mix bomb loads ranging from 100 pound bombs up to 1000 pound bombs. But you can disregard all bomb options except for the first three. The three 1000 pound bombs, the four 500 pound bombs, or the eight 250 pound bombs. And once you have the B-25 fully spaded, you should only use those three, both in ground RB and in air RB. The rear gunner has access to two Browning 50 caliber machine guns with 300 rounds each. Horizontal guidance is plus minus 38 degrees and vertical guidance is minus 35 and plus 40. Now the minus 35 degrees is actually an issue and it's not enough, especially since the B-25 does not have any ventral turrets. Yeah well, a turret. So either you need to move the bomb by itself in order to engage them coming from below and behind, or you just have to wait until they decide to attack you. The two waist or beam gunners also have access to a 50 caliber browning each, although only with 250 rounds of ammo. Horizontal guidance is an okay plus minus 40 degrees, but vertical guidance minus 25 and plus 10 is not the greatest. And once again we see the issue of not having a ventral turret. Horizontally, the dorsal turret can pick up the slack though. The dorsal turret sits a little too close to the cockpit in my opinion, but it is what it is. The dorsal turret also has two heavy machine guns, although only with 200 rounds of ammo for them each. Horizontal guidance is just fine because you can rotate it 360 degrees, and vertical guidance is plus 89, which means you can almost shoot straight up. The nose gunner slash bombardier also has a 50 caliber browning, and he has 300 rounds of ammo. And he has a pretty amazing, although noisy view, whenever the pilot decides to open up with his 60-50 calibers as well. The nose gunner's horizontal and vertical guidance is pretty poor, but in my opinion it's completely irrelevant. Because nobody will ever just use the gunner view and just use the forward facing heavy machine gun. Instead everybody will bring the 6-50 caliber machine guns to bear instead. And lastly, but definitely the complete opposite of least, we have the pilot's ability to use 6 forward facing 50 caliber Brownings, and they come with a total of 2400 rounds. 
And this massive amount of forward phrase and firepower is really what makes the Beach 25 so interesting and fun to play. In ARB you can basically kill everything on the ground but heavy and medium tanks. And if you're lucky you can go and destroy other bombers or even get lucky with a fighter kill. And of course in Grand B you can use them to kill enemy SPAAs or even get lucky with an open top tank destroyer. And they're powerful enough to destroy tracks on tanks and that means more kill assists for you. It's completely up to you if you prefer using the B-25 either in Grand B or in ARB. This bomber will just do fine in either scenario. The B-25 works fine both at its own BR and in full up tier. Just always keep in mind that the B-25 is a bomber and not a heavy fighter. And your biggest headache is really just to choose which kind of B-25 you want to use. Either the PBJs with no bombardier and heavier forward armament, or using the regular B-25 with the bombardier for precision bombing. Personally, I never use the B-25 as a regular bomber. I always drop down to the deck and then use my bomb loads on either medium tanks or pillboxes in ARB. Of course, down at the deck there's more action going on and there's a much larger chance that you'll get hunted down by an enemy fighter. But being low means that you don't have to worry about being attacked from below since you don't have a ventral turret and this way you're protecting your belly. So lucky for me, I think this BF-109 ran out of 20mm cannon shells. But here you can really see how tough the B-25 actually is. Both the armor plating and the airframe itself can help you soak up a lot of light machine gun rounds. The B-17 is the first 4 engine heavy bomber we meet in the US Bomber Tech 3 and it's a very iconic one to boot. The United States produced close to 13,000 of them, from 1938 when it was first introduced until the end of World War II in 1945. The B-17 was the third most produced bomber of all times. 
The black triangle should indicate that this bomber belongs to the 8th Air Force Bombardment Group, 1st Air Division. There should be a white letter in the triangle indicating the specific bomb group. So if you want to be exact, you can put a big white letter in the triangle. So that was more information than you would have ever wanted to know. You're welcome. In War Thunder we have access to three different B-17 models starting at better rating 4.7 and ending with the one we're going to look at, the B-17G model. And the G stands for NATS. Briefly talking about the difference between the models, the E and EL models share the same bomb load but have different defensive armaments and the G model has even heavier defensive armament and an increased bomb load. The defensive armament on the B-17 started out with 7 guns and ended up with 13s total. The G model was the last and most produced model with over 8000 made. Some of the pros for the B-17, very good defensive armament. This G model has a total of 13 heavy machine guns on it, so no wonder an American journalist called it the Flying Fortress. Good armor protection. So littered around the B-17 is a bunch of 7mm armor plates and most gunners and the pilots are protected in some degree. Decent bomb load. So in general the American bombers, even the heavier ones, are okay when we talk about bomb loads. It's not nearly as heavy as for instance the British ones, but it's kind of in the middle of the pack. And the G model has a bigger bomb load than both the E and the EL model. Decent flight characteristics. The limits for the wings are just over 500 km an hour, so we do need to be careful in a dive, but it's still better than some other heavy bombers. The landing gear is pretty sturdy, with a limit close to 300 km an hour. The B-17 has both good combat flaps and takeoff flaps, and they won't rip until you get close to 400 km an hour. It being a 4 engine heavy bomber of course also means that it's pretty slow, so it's just something you have to learn to deal with. And I won't suggest that you actually fight the controls, it just makes everything worse. And some of the cons for the B-17. Large target. Well I guess that's pretty self-explanatory. You being a 4 engine heavy bomber means that you are pretty easy to spot. And that also means that people will start shooting at you from pretty far away. And there's really nothing you can do about it but pay them back kindly with all of your 50 caliber machine guns. That part is pretty fun though. Bad rate of climb. Even fully spaded, your rate of climb is only 4.6 meters a second, and that is pretty bad. Weak wings. Something you do need to look out for is how aggressively you turn, and whenever you see that wing load warning across the screen, you do need to react to it and then just level out, otherwise you're just going to rip your wings and it can go very fast. The wings themselves are also pretty large and they are full of fuel tanks. And that of course also means that it's pretty easy to hit them and you'll just catch fire and it happens all the time. Another thing to note and that is the advantage with the G model over the E and the L model is that the G model has forward facing machine guns in a chin mount. Neither of the two earlier models have that chin mount. So if you're facing a baddie coming towards you and you are in those two models, do everything you can to turn around so you'll face them or rather you'll show your ass to them where you can greet them with many more 50 caliber machine guns. As mentioned before, the G model has the largest bomb load of the B-17s in the game. The total amount of TNT you can drop might look impressive, but it's really not. At your own battle rating at 5.3, it takes two of those 2000 pound bombs in order to kill a single base. And a single 2000 pound bomb has just shy over 500 kilograms worth of TNT. If I remember correctly, it takes shy over 600 kilograms worth of TNT to destroy a base at 5.3. And that means that 3 quarters of the second bomb's TNT content is wasted. And in up tiers and on maps with 4 bases, you need 3 of those 2000 pound bombs in order to destroy a single base. So with that in mind, this heavy bomb load is not really that heavy at all. The B-17 is pretty unwieldy, so I wouldn't suggest that you go for 10 columns. If you want to do something besides bases, go kill some pillboxes. If you happen to be the guy who decides which gunner goes to what position, remember to assign the rear turret to the guy you don't like or who has the worst body odor. The rear gunner has access to two heavy machine guns and you have 575 rounds of ammo each, which is actually quite a lot and you'll need it. Horizontal guidance is only plus minus 20 degrees and vertical guidance is even worse with plus minus 30, although 
you do have a ventral turret, hooray for that, so that turret will and can pick up the slack. The beam or waste gunners also have a Browning heavy machine gun with 600 rounds of ammo each. Horizontal guidance is very nice with plus minus 60 degrees, and vertical guidance is also fine because of the ventral turret, hooray for that, with plus minus 30 degrees. On the two earlier models in the game, the waste gunners actually stood back to back, but that really restricted the waste gunners' movements. So that's why the waste gunners on the G model are staggered like this. It also gives them 10 degrees more horizontal guidance compared to the two earlier models. And here we have the best seat of the house, the ventral turret. He has an amazing view, but man the turret looks pretty uncomfortable. The turret was retractable and of course not manned while taking off. It was only late in the flight that the turret was manned and then lowered. The ventral turret also has two heavy machine guns with 500 rounds of ammo each. The horizontal and vertical guidance are basically perfect. You can rotate the turret 360 degrees and vertical guidance is minus 90, which means you can shoot straight down. This gun position looks super awkward and it was not always manned. In War Thunder we always find this position manned with a gunner, but in real life this station was assigned to the radio operator. He also has plenty of ammunition and has a horizontal guidance with plus minus 40 degrees and a vertical guidance of minus 20 and plus 30. And if you're in doubt, I mean the gun, not the radio operator. Closer towards the cockpit we find the dorsal turret. He also has access to two heavy machine guns with 500 rounds of ammo each. Horizontal guidance is also 360 degrees and vertical guidance is near perfect with plus 85 degrees. Towards the nose we find two cheek heavy machine guns and these are operated by the navigator. Horizontal guidance is minus 20 and plus 30 and vertical guidance is plus minus 30 degrees. And last but not least in the very front we find the chin turret. This turret was manned by the bombardier and he has also access to two heavy machine guns. And this turret is probably the best addition to the G model. The Germans quickly found out that the earlier models of the P-17 did not have a lot of defensive firepower directly to the front. And that's why they in the beginning opted for a lot of head-on attacks. And because of the losses from those head-on attacks, the B-17s got equipped with this chin turret. The turret has an excellent horizontal guidance of plus minus 86 degrees. Good vertical guidance with minus 46 and plus 26 degrees. This was one of the smaller maps, so I knew I did not have to side climb to safety, since I would be over the bases before the enemy fighters would climb up to my altitude. But again, the annoying thing is that the second bomb's TNT content will barely be able to be used on the base, so bomb number 2 and 4 are almost wasted. The standard altitude for heavy bombers are 4500 meters, and that's usually enough on smaller maps. However, if you're playing on one of the bigger maps, I definitely suggest that you side climb with the B-17. Climbing to 6500 meters or even 7000 meters will not ensure your safety, but it will definitely help. And besides, at that altitude, you're closer to your top speed. I mentioned earlier that you shouldn't fight the controls of the B-17 or any other heavy bomber really. 
just more or less let it do what it wants to do. Depending on the size of the map you're on, once you start returning to the base, you can more or less put all the engines to idle. And since the B-17 really does not like to lose altitude, getting rid of the speed right away is a good idea. Another good thing are the takeoff and combat flaps of the B-17 and you should definitely use them. And just like I said in the guide for the Japanese bombers, the link is right up there in the corner. You can make the return and landing back at the base into a minigame, that's what I usually do. It improves your skill, understanding of the aircraft and well, it fights boredom. You can use the B-17 for Grand B, I just never do it. I think it's just too big and too slow. But I suggest that if you want to use it, only use the four 2000 pound bombs. At least the evidence shows that even a near miss will result in a kill. Also sitting at better rating 5.3, we find the PB4Y-2 and the PB is a designation that the US Navy used, just like the PBY Catalina and the PB stands for Patrol Bomber and the Y is a code for the manufacturer, in this case Consolidated Aircraft. The PB4Y on the stat sheet and in real life was a pretty amazing bomber, but as usual and just like Angry Joe says, Gaijin, you fucked up. In this case, Gaijin nerfed the original flight speed with about 25% and they also nerfed the bomb load. But let's just dive right into it because there's a lot to talk about. Some of the pros for the PB4Y 50 caliber galore. This big girl has 12 50 caliber heavy browning machine guns, and although it's one less than the B17G model, they're all placed in twin mount setups. And under really good circumstances, you could bring up to 8 heavy machine guns to bear on the same target. Ouch. Decent bomb load. I know I just said that Gaijin messed this one up and they did, but I'll talk more about that later. So for right now, what we have is the same bomb load as the B-17G model. Very good armor protection. Spread throughout this aircraft, we found a lot of both 10mm and 13mm armor plates. And get this, even the oil coolers on the engines have armor protection. This is the first. No fuel tanks and other wings. The placement of the fuel tanks in the PB4Y helps the aircraft survive a lot of damage, since all the fuel is concentrated in the wing routes and across the fuselage. Something quite unusual to see on large bombers like this is the tricycle landing gear, and it's really a nice deal. Once you land, you can just hit the brakes and keep them engaged all the time. You never have to worry about a nose over. So it's much much faster to land, rearm and then get airborne again. So I'm not sure if this is because the PB4Y is so heavy, but once you have rearmed, you're actually starting mid-air again, so you don't have to worry about the takeoff. High wing speeds. So this is basically the only pro there is for the PB4Y's flight characteristics. You can get up to 600 km an hour in a dive before you need to worry. And some of the cons for the PB4Y. Huge target. Uh, enough said. Horrible flight characteristics overall. It's slow. If you get up to around 350 km an hour, congratulations. Being this slow at this battle rating is very dangerous. Looking at the internet, I found out that the PB4Y and the B24 Liberator were actually faster than the B17, but Gaijin has chosen to make this one very, very slow, and it's easily over 100 km an hour slower than it's supposed to be. The wing design on the PB4Y is very different from a B-17 for instance. The PB4Y is a close cousin of the B-24 Liberator which I will review after this one and god help us all. But they basically have the same wing designs. The wings were designed for medium to low altitude long range reconnaissance bomber missions. And Gajin has translated that into a plane you cannot turn with basically, so thank you for that Gajin. If you've played the PB-Y Catalina you may have thought that that plane had a slow rate of climb the PB4Y is even worse, it's only 3.5 meters a second. What the F? 
And honestly, don't ever worry about climbing with this aircraft. Just don't even try. Just fly in a straight line or dive. That's about it. Humongous gargantuan vertical stabilizer. So just looking at the vertical stabilizer on the PB4Y is just ridiculous. It's so absolutely big. Oh dear God in heaven, why are you so big? And of course you're going to get hit in the vertical stabilizer all the time and you're going to lose it all the time. And that's not even the worst. You have two dorsal turrets that are almost useless if you're getting attacked from behind since that huge vertical stabilizer is not going to help you. It's actually working against you. And if this plane would have had the same tilt configuration as the B-24 Liberator, which is, is a cousin of, you wouldn't have had that issue. The last pro I had for the PB-4Y is also the last con I have for it. So after you have rearmed, you are starting mid-air, which also means that you don't have the option to either J out or change your loadout, and that is super annoying. If I've been a good bomber pilot and managed to actually bomb my target and then return just to rearm, Often you end up being the last player on the team and there's no reason to commit suicide and just take off again. So often I decide to rearm and just stay out again and save the silver lines. But with this aircraft, that's just not an option. And just to clarify, when I said that this bomber had the same bomb load as the B-17G model, I was talking about how much TNT it can drop in total. In War Thunder, the PBY can drop maximum 8,000 pounds of bombs, and in real life, it could drop almost 13,000 pounds of bombs. And that included both mines and torpedoes. But none of those options are available for this bomber in game. At the bomber's own better rating, it takes a bit over 600 kilograms of TNT to destroy a base. But of course, each of those 2,000 pound bombs only have shy over 500 kilograms worth of TNT in them each. And so you're running into the same issue with this bomber as you do with the B-17G model. The second bombs and the fourth bombs TNT content is basically wasted. The rear gun has access to two Browning heavy machine guns with 400 rounds of ammo each. Both the horizontal and vertical guidance for this rear turret is actually much better than usual. Horizontal guidance is plus minus 70 degrees and vertical guidance is a nice minus 41 and plus 70 degrees. The PB4Y also has some very unique waste gunner positions. This bomber is the only bomber where the waste gunners have access to two heavy machine guns each. Their horizontal guidance are minus 95 and plus 55 and vertical guidance minus 55 and plus 80, which is very nice. And something else that is unique for this bomber, you find two dorsal turrets. The only other bomber that has access to two dorsal turrets is the B29. They both have access to two Browning Heavy Machine Guns with 380 rounds each. Horizontal guidance is as expected 360 degrees, but vertical guidance is only 67 degrees. But no matter what, with two dorsal turrets you can put a lot of firepower to bear. The nose turret of the PB4Y is also very effective and the gunner has access to two Heavy Machine Guns with an impressive 600 rounds of ammo each. Horizontal guidance is plus minus 80 degrees and vertical guidance is a very nice minus 55 and plus 70 degrees. So overall he has much better coverage than other similar nose turrets. The more time I spend with the PB4Y the more I like it and it has quickly turned into my favorite heavy bomber in the US Tech Tree. Once you've become comfortable with the bomber's characteristics and its weaknesses and its strength, it's incredible fun to play. If you want to use this big girl as a regular bomber, which of course you can, I suggest that you put it in a 5 or 10 degree dive right away. That way you should get up to around 450 or 500 kilometers an hour. That should be enough for you to be able to deliver your bombs and then head back and get some more if that's what you want.
alternatively just stick around and see what happens because you will definitely attract baddies and that can be incredible fun as well. If you want to play gunship, a good idea is to actually drop altitude and get as close to the ground as you can. That way you will protect your very big and exposed and weak belly. Of course that is not an option if they are already on top of you, but if you can dictate the encounters then definitely do so. If you happen to lose the PB4Y, it's not really a big deal at 5.3. The full repair cost is not even 7,000 silver lines. And besides, if you kill a base or two, that repair bill is already covered. And most of the time when you bring this girl out, you're also going to get a couple of fighter kills and that will only sweeten the deal. If you can overcome the flight characteristics and learn to love them or learn to accept them, you will have a great time with the PB4Y. Okay, so in my opinion, this would put the PB4Y at 5.7 and give it the increased bomb load and the increased speed and I would be absolutely thrilled. And instead, they could put this B24 Liberator down to 5.3 because Gaijin has turned this B24 into a dumpster fire of a heavy bomber. And I've decided that instead of calling it the Liberator, I'm going to call it the Liptard because it's just as useful at 5.7. Of course, it's not all doom and gloom with the Liptard, so let's look at some pros. Good defensive armament. Once again, we have a lot of 50 caliber machine guns, and this time, as a special guest, we even have a Vinsel turret. For reasons only known to Gaijin, the B24 Liptard is 100 km an hour faster than the PB4Y. And the crazy thing is, the only difference between the Liptard and the PB4Y is that the PB has a slightly longer fuselage. They share the same wings and the same engines. Because of how the tail is designed on the Liptard, the dorsal gunner has a much greater chance to assisting the rear gunner in defending from attack from behind, and that's a great plus. And just like on the PB4Y, you here have a tricycle landing gear, which is a great help for stopping faster and get faster off the ground again. And some of the cons for the Liptard. Horrible flight characteristics. The flight characteristics of the B24 is basically identical to the PB4Y, the only difference being that the Liptard is faster. Bad bomb load for the BR. As all of you smart people have guessed, the Liptard's bomb load is basically identical to the ones of the PB4Y. But more on that later. High repair cost. So here you have a bomber that's actually worse in my opinion compared to the PB4Y, but this one sits a better rating 5.7. And the worst thing is, it's more expensive to repair, it's almost twice as expensive as the PB4Y. The PB4Y costs about 7,000 silver lines to fully repair, the Liptard almost 13,000 silver lines. So you're getting very bad flight characteristics, bad bomb load for the BR, and yet, 
Is 4,000 silver lines more expensive than the B17G to repair? And yes, I'm aware about how Gajin calculates the repair cost, but in the case of a Liptard, that makes even less sense. As you can see here, the B24 has very limited bomb load options, and you can just about drop the same amount of TNT as the PB4Y. There's just a bigger problem here, because this plane sets a battle rating 5.7, and that means with a full bomb load, you can just about kill 1.5 bases at your own battle rating, and that is pretty horrible for something that is considered to be a heavy bomber. The rear gun of the B24 has a pretty good seat, he has 250 Browning caliber machine guns with 400 rounds of ammo each. Horizontal guidance is a very nice plus minus 85 degrees. Vertical guidance is minus 40 which is nice and plus 71 which is even nicer. The waist gunners have a really good opportunity to get to know each other because they share a very cramped compartment and that's why they have a very odd minus 20 but plus 80 degrees horizontal guidance. Vertical guidance is very nice with plus minus 45 degrees. Here we have the hero of the Liptard, the Ventral Terror Gunner position. The gunner can play with two Browning Heavy Machine Guns, and he has 508 rounds of ammo for each gun, which is a very odd number. The turret can rotate 360 degrees, and vertical guidance is minus 90 and plus 5 degrees. And I guess the plus 5 degrees is because of how the underside of the fuselage is curved. And here we have a quite rare dust position, because he can elevate the guns 90 degrees straight up. It's usually like 87 or even lower than that, so good for you. Horizontal guidance is also nice with 360 degrees, so you couldn't really get anything better. He has access to 400 rounds of ammo each for his 250 caliber Brownings. But wait, there's more. Because of how the tail is designed, he has a clear view down the back of the plane and can thereby help the rear gunner defend from attacks from behind. In the nose we find a very busy looking position. It's manned by the bombardier and he can use three heavy machine guns. Two in the cheek positions and one directly between his legs. And I bet he can feel the power. They all have 300 rounds of ammunition, and they all share very poor vertical and horizontal guidance, sadly. So in this particular fight, I could see that I was in at least a 6.3 game, which means it was kind of pointless for me to go actually after a base, so instead, I went for ground targets. It only takes a few pillboxes and tank kills to get the same amount of silver lines you would get for destroying a base anyhow. And this being one of the larger maps, I knew I would never reach the target before I would have been intercepted. Trying to turn with the B-24 is an experience in itself, and this was basically the hardest I could turn. Returning to the base, I ran into this guy. I did get a kill out of it. But because I performed a cardinal sin and actually turning and maneuvering with the plane close to the ground, I ended up crashing and he sadly got the credit for it. He had barely damaged me, but uh, I did this to myself.
Right now, the lip tie kind of looks a little asymmetrical, and that's because I ran into a baddie just before I started recording. I did get some crits on him, and he retreated, but not before he made me look like this. And since the lip tart is a big yummy target, the fun just never stops. Okay people, we made it, or rather, well I made it and you watched. So this is the last prod bomber in the US tech tree, the mighty B29. And right off the bat, if you do not run a premium account, don't even bother playing this aircraft. It's much much too expensive. After you have spent your 10 free initial repairs, this bomber will cost you 49,000 silver lines to fully repair. And it's really just insane to play and replace this aircraft without the advantage of a premium account. That being said, let's see what we get. Some of the pros for the B-29. Very large bomb load. The B-29 has the second largest bomb load of any bomber you can find in War Thunder, with a whooping 4800 kilograms of TNT. But I'll come back to that later. Fast. The top speed for the B-29 is a whooping 641 km an hour. But the catch is, you need to get up to 9000 meters in order to obtain that speed. Very good defensive armament. Here you also find 12 Browning heavy machine guns. And one of the turrets even has 4 of them. And all in all, you have 12,000 rounds of ammo with you for the heavy machine guns. And that is a lot. If you manage to drop all your bombs on targets, and survive the match, and actually win the match, it can be worth your while and you can earn a good amount of silver lions. Sturdy. So if you happen to just face light machine guns because enemy fighters have spent all the cannon rounds, I wouldn't say you are immune but close to it. The airframe can survive a lot of damage. Some of the cons for the B-29. So expensive. And like I said earlier, if you don't run a premium account, just completely ignore this aircraft. I made a video on repair cost a little while ago and I think you should watch that because this bumper is featured. A little boring. I think the average player using a B29 just sits back, grabs a beverage and then just watch YouTube or TV or fiddle with his phone until he gets up to altitude, then hope he's not gonna engage by a fighter and then just fly back. In my opinion, you can only do that a couple of times and then you'll get bored to death. Because honestly, there's no other viable way of really playing the B-29 efficiently. Big yummy target. 
So whenever an any player sees your B-29 tag, everybody will head towards you. They know you're pretty dangerous with all your 50 caliber Brownings, but they also know how expensive you are to repair and replace. And that is a great motivation for a lot of players to make sure you're losing as many silver lines as possible. And you definitely will. Up tiers. At your own BR and in down tiers, you're usually fine and you don't really have to worry about enemy opposition too much. And you can just stay around six or 7,000 meters and you should be safe. However, but in up tiers, everybody will be in a jet fighter. And in a jet, climbing up to nine or 10,000 meters is no big deal and they will get up to altitude much faster than you will. And with all the 20mm cannons and 30mm cannons those fighters are equipped with, they'll quickly bring you down. And that ain't fun. This looks so nice. You can either bring 20 500 pound bombs, 40 500 pound bombs, 18 1000 pound bombs, or 8 2000 pound bombs. You will get the biggest bang for the buck with the 40 500 pound bombs. With that bomb load you can release 4800 kilograms of TNT. However if you don't release the bombs in series it can be really annoying to release that many bombs. Depending on the BR of the match I either go for the 8 2000 pound bombs or the 18 1000 pound bombs. Using the 8 2000 pound bombs is the easiest but you are going to lose a lot of TNT on the bases depending on the BR. My go-to is usually the 18 1000 pound bombs. That way you can easily adjust how much TNT you spend on each base and thereby minimize the waste. And with that bomb load you're still dropping 4.3 tons worth of TNT. Guardian's version of the rear gun of the B-29 has been nerfed from what is originally supposed to be. Here you only have access to two Browning heavy machine guns. Originally there should also be a 20mm cannon for him to use. But no no, we can't have that. At least the gun has plenty of ammunition for the 50 caliber Brownings. He has 1000 rounds of ammo for each gun. The turret's horizontal guidance is actually pretty poor with plus minus 35 degrees. Luckily the vertical guidance is very nice with plus minus 60 degrees. The B-29 and the Russian copy, since they couldn't figure out how to make such a great bomber on their own, are the only two bombers who have access to two ventral turrets. And all these turrets, except for the rear gun we just saw, are remotely operated. This turret has two heavy machine guns with 1000 rounds of ammo each. Horizontal guidance is 360 degrees and vertical guidance is minus 60 and plus 5 degrees. So in this shot we see yet another remotely operated turret, again with two heavy machine guns, 1000 rounds of ammo each, horizontal guidance is 360 degrees and vertical guidance is plus 60 degrees. Each of the three gunners could basically operate all the turrets by themselves and they use this analog computer. In real life the computer makes corrections for wind, temperature, altitude and speed, but of course none of that is available in game, sadly. Another thing to note is that this compartment is protected by armor plates. Here we have the second of the ventral turrets and the stats are identical to the first one. This last dorsal turret is the most impressive one. Here we have four heavy machine guns and they have 1000 rounds of ammo each. It can rotate 360 degrees and vertical guidance is plus 60 degrees. This match was at my own BR of 7.0, so I wasn't really too worried about enemy jet fighters. That's also why I felt that the altitude of 6 or 7000 meters would be enough. I used my go-to bomb load of 18 1000 pound bombs. And knowing the BR, three of those bombs should be enough to destroy a base. The two first bases got destroyed by strike fighters, so there was only one base left and then the main airfield.
I'm pretty sure I hit with all the bombs, since I had dropped 4.3 tons of TNT. So heading back to the airfield, I did like any other proper B-29 pilot would do, look at YouTube on the second monitor. I did wonder though why all these Japanese tentacle videos suddenly showed up in my recommended list. So no matter what I did, I could not put out this damn fire, and it was very annoying. So I did lose the bomber, we won the match, I hit with 4.3 tons of TNT, and I got a fighter kill, and that gave me close to 42,000 silver lines. I still had some free repairs on the B-29, so it was a net plus, but if I had to pay for the B-29, I would have lost 9,000 silver lines, and that's not really bad. If I had not met the fighter, I think I would have netted maybe 30,000 silver lines, give or take. But again, all this is with a premium account running. And these are my recommendations. I would use the TBD in both air and ground RB until you get the PBM1 Mariner. If you really want to destroy bases in air RB, use the PBY5 Catalina. Skip the B18 altogether. After the Mariner, definitely use the B34, both for ground and air RB. I suggest that you research and buy, but skip spading the first B25 bomber. There's no reason to waste time on it really. Wait until you unlock the B-25 sitting at battle rating 4.3. If you are eager to try the iconic B-17s, you can use and spade the first E model. But if you can wait, I would suggest you just unlock it and then spade the E-L model instead. Definitely use and spade the PB-4Y. It's a great bomber once you get to know it. In case you can't get comfortable with the PB-4Y, you can definitely use the last B-17 model. And in many ways, it's much easier to use. Unlock the B-24 Liberator, but I do not suggest that you use it, it's just not worth it. Lastly, of course, the big B-29, and as I said, if you do not run a premium account, completely disregard it, it's simply too expensive to use. In my opinion, the last bombers you should use for the US Bomber tree is either the PB-4Y or the B-17G model. It took me a couple of weeks to actually make this video. I had a great time and I did learn a lot though. So do me a favor and give this video some love. Either give it a like or you can even go overboard and give me a subscription. I have added some links in the video description if you want to go the extra mile and support the channel in a more direct fashion. Thank you for watching and until next time, remember to deploy your die breaks. Have a good one.